afternoon uh, or good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome uh, at the Jantina Thomas Lecture 2013. Uh, the university chair, Jantina Thomas, is named after the first female professor of the University of Groningen, Jantina Thomas. And she was famous for her research in biology, more specifically in genetics and botany. The chair has been established in order to enable female visiting professors to do research with colleagues here in the field of gender studies. And one of the tasks of the Jantina Thomas chair is to give an inaugural speech, and that's why we're all here. This year, Victoria Breskel from Yale University has the 10th Jantina Thomas position at the Faculty of Economics and Business, and it's an honor for me as Vice Dean of this faculty to introduce her to you before she will give her inaugural speech. Women in power, hard to earn, earn difficult to signal, and easy to lose. But before I do that, let me first explain the course of the evening. Because we not only have a wonderful speech of Tori lying ahead of us, we also are proud to have a very interesting co-speaker, namely Jolanda Sap, the former leader and member of parliament of the Dutch Greens, GroenLinks in Dutch. She stepped down after the election of 2012, after a turbulent period of almost two years as a leader, being the successor of Femke Halsma. Currently, she works as an advisor for business and government organizations on issues of sustainable business models, and she recently became chairman of the NPHF Federation for Health. The program is that first Tori will speak, and right after her, Yolanda will take the floor. She will reflect on her presentation, both from a scientific point of view, because she is also an economist and was, amongst others, author of the book Out of the Margin, Feminist Perspectives on Economics, but also strongly based on her own experiences. And after they both have finished their talks, there is room for you in the audience so you can ask questions or raise issues you want to talk about. And they will both be standing there, having a lively interaction with you and also maybe with each other. Uh, there's plenty of time, so uh, feel free to have a debate. We will first listen to Tori Breskel. She's one of the most influential and well-known scientists in the field of gender, power and leadership. After a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of Michigan, she received her master's and PhD in social psychology from Yale University, where she was supported by a graduate research fellowship from the National Science Foundation. For a while, she hesitated between a career in science or a career in politics. Just before finishing her PhD, she went to work in the office of Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton, and although she only went back to Yale to collect her PhD and then to return to Washington, both love and science, or maybe love for science, I don't know, were so strong that she decided to stay at Yale, thankfully. Her research focuses around the impact of stereotypes on the status and power of women within organizations, particularly when they violate gender stereotypes. Her research suggests that women face different challenges than men in the quest for leadership roles and their ability to hold on to these positions. And she will probably explain today why that is the case and maybe what can be done about it, I hope. Her work has been published in top journals like ASQ, Administrative Science Quarterly, Psychological Science, and other top journals. But she was all, the research was also widely reported on in the popular press, including New York Times, Business Week, The Wall Street Journal, and The Washington Post. Sorry, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good evening. This is such an incredible honor for me to be here. Um, and I just want to give a special thanks to Floor Rink and Yanka Stoker, who invited me out to give this lecture, but also to get a chance to visit your, your university and to get to know some of you. And I've been here for over a week, and I'm thoroughly impressed. So um, I think I'm about to move here from New Haven. I like it so much. Um, so I'm absolutely thrilled tonight to be giving you this lecture on women in power. Why for women power can sometimes be hard to earn, difficult to signal, and oftentimes easy to lose. So we know I could give you a lot of statistics on this, but I'm just going to do this uh, pretty quickly, in that there are fewer women than men in high power positions across the world. So. There are fewer women leaders in politics um, across the world. There are only 19 female presidents and prime ministers in the United States. Women still make up only 18% of Congress. We also know that there are fewer women than men um, in the very top high power positions in major corporations around the world. I looked up a statistic recently that in the Netherlands, um, women make up only about 14% of the members of board of directors. 
in the United States among our major corporations in the Fortune 500, uh, we still have only 4% women CEOs. And I could go on and on, and I'm sure many of you, because you're interested in this topic, are well aware of some of these statistics. So the question is, excuse me, um, how can we actually increase the number of women in powerful positions? And there have been a lot of answers to this question, but I'm just going to sort of take one hook for this lecture tonight and tell you a little bit about somebody I'm sure you're already familiar with, which is uh, Sheryl Sandberg. So Sheryl Sandberg is the Chief Operating Officer of Facebook. How many of you are on Facebook? Everybody, right? Um, how many of you have heard of her book, Lean In? Is this a popular? Yeah. Um, this was also translated in, into Dutch as well. And her response to this question um, about how we can increase the number of women in powerful positions um, really did focus on what women themselves can do. And so for one thing, um, I'll just paraphrase her basic argument, which is that women need to lean in, in the sense that they need to be more aggressive, more assertive. They need to be able to ask for what they want, to initiate negotiations and pay raises, and actually make what is what they need at work known to everybody else. So in other words, um, be more sort of assertive and aggressive. And this book that she published just this year, she had a very famous TED Talk with millions and millions of views. And this book with it was an outgrowth of that TED Talk. And it's been on the bestseller list for over 34 weeks, has been translated into over 25 languages. There it is in Dutch. Did you see that? <laughs> That was really hard for me to find, by the way. <laughs> but I had to put it somewhere. Um, and even uh, in the United States, people have started these lean-in support groups where women, and sometimes men, will get together on how they can basically act, really, to put it quite frankly, more like men, more assertively and more aggressively. And so... My argument here is that this sort of strategy of leaning in, it's very well intentioned, but it may not be an effective way for women to gain power based on what we know about the science of social psychology of gender. Because when women lean in, they can experience um, negative consequences in terms of economic and social penalties, and we call these backlash effects. And so the core argument that I'm going to try to convince you of is that the gender stereotypes that we hold, in other words, the beliefs that we have about men and women, profoundly affect whether women will obtain and retain high power positions in politics and in corporations. But first, uh, something about gender stereotypes, for those of you who aren't psychology majors, um, they are unique from other types of stereotypes, say of racial or ethnic groups or different groups from different social, sexual orientations in that they tend to be not only descriptive, describing what women are like. So people, um, most of us, well, I do, tend to have a stereotype or just a general belief that on average, women are more warm than men. That would be a descriptive stereotype. But gender stereotypes are unique in that they also have this pre and proscriptive component, which says what men and women should or should not be like. So it's not just that we believe that women are warmer than men, but that women should be warmer than men or should not be cold. And so the result of this is that when women, and it also can be men in certain cases, but I'm going to focus on women and high power women tonight. When women violate these gender stereotypes, in other words, perhaps act not warmly, this leads to perceivers or other people experiencing pretty strong negative emotions towards that individual, which leads to these social and economic penalties that I talked about before, these backlash effects. And I'll get into more specifics about exactly what they are. So one great example has to do with some work by Lori Rudman on self-promotion, where she finds that um, Ironically, when women are going to apply for a job and they talk about the particular reasons why they are especially qualified for a job, in other words, they really self-promote, they're actually less likely to get that job compared to women who don't do that. Okay? And the opposite is true for men. So when men self-promote, this tends to work quite well for them. 
So um, I also just wanted to tell you really quickly um, to bolster my argument about gender stereotypes being important that women, um, high power women who are sort of in the trenches also tend to believe that this is true as well. So there was a study that was done of over 400 uh, female vice presidents or women who had even higher rank than vice presidents in the US Fortune 1000 companies. And they asked them, what are your barriers to sort of success? How did you get where you are? And what's stopping you from even getting higher? And what these women said is they rated um, gender stereotypes and preconceptions of women as the most important barriers to their advancement. So this is coming sort of right out of their own mouths, that this is something that's real, that they're experiencing in the working world today, despite the fact that they've had so much success. So um, the core question of my talk then is really going to be focused on how is it then that gender stereotypes do in fact influence women's power in organizations and perhaps um, stop them from attaining higher positions of power. And what I'd like to do is just sort of tell a narrative about gender and the road to power, where I'm going to start off in part one addressing whether merely just having the intention to get power may harm women than men, just perhaps wanting it. Um, in part two, I'm going to address once men and women do have power, do they actually communicate that power differently? And then finally, in part three, I'm going to answer the question or try to give you some examples of my own research that shows how women's power may, in fact, be more fragile and easily lost than men's power. OK. My apologies for this um, tr translation thing. I work on a Mac, so this is the PC version of my Mac talk which looks beautiful, by the way. If any of you want to come up here and look at it, the colors are amazing. There's candy in my computer that you could eat. Um, so my apologies about this. OK. So I'm going to start off with an example. Um, as Yanka mentioned, I used to work in politics. And there's a senator from Washington State in the United States um, named Patty Murray. And she calls herself just a mom in tennis shoes. But more than anything else, um, she's a very, very powerful woman in the United States. Um, she spent over 20 years in the Senate. She chairs one of the most powerful Senate subcommittees. She's a key member of the Democratic Leadership Caucus, and she's known as an earmark, earmark rainmaker. So that parlance, that fancy jargon, basically just means that she um, is able to bring home a lot of money, federal dollars, to Washington State to do things like build bridges and schools and that kind of thing. So it's a really good indicator for politicians in America as to whether or not they have power. And she definitely does. Um, what's also really interesting about this, so uh, when I was working in DC, I had this experience um, when I was working with Senator Clinton of going to a lot of stump speeches by different senators. And I was particularly interested in the female senators because I'm interested in power and gender. And one thing that I continually noticed when I was there was that um, these female senators, as powerful as they were, almost always started off their stump speech, or kind of their regular speech, with a story about how they never planned to be a politician. Uh, that they never wanted this, that it somehow just fell in their lap. So I'll give you an example. Um, so this is a quote, if you go to Patty Murray's website, this is the very first thing you'll see. This is the very first quote. It says, Patty Murray never planned to enter politics, but today she's serving her third time, her third term in the United States Senate as a member of the Democratic leadership. She's not alone. Um, Nancy Pelosi, I would argue, one of the most powerful women in Washington who used to be Speaker of the House, also goes around saying these same things where she says she knew one thing about politics. I never intended to be a part of it. So to me, there's a bit of irony in these statements and that the primary purpose of these jobs, you know, being a senator, being um, Speaker of the House, is to trade in and wield power. That's their job. That's what they do. So it's especially ironic that they go way out of their way to let everybody else know that they never wanted the, the most prominent feature of their job in the first place. 
And it occurred to me that um, these individuals, these female, uh, very powerful women, are really sort of masters of impression management. And so there could be some reason why they're doing this. There could be a good reason. And so digging a little bit into the stereotyping, gender uh, stereotyping literature, um, there's some indication that just even women hinting that they might want power could cause social and economic penalties, in other words, backlash effects. Because power and power seeking are very central to the constructs of agency and masculinity. So for a woman, having an intention to get power is not only inconsistent with female gender prescriptions of communality or warmth and niceness, but it's also inconsistent with female gender proscriptions that are linked to dominance. So women should not be dominant is one of the strongest gender stereotype proscriptions that we have. So I'm just gonna tell you very quickly about one study. I have a lot of work on this, but I'll just show you the basic effect. And in this study, basically what we did is we had our participants or our subjects um, view what they thought was a real website um, online. And it was from, just happened to be from Oregon State. And um, our population didn't recognize any of these senators that we mentioned. And all we did is we had participants read one, were randomly assigned to read one of four different kinds of websites. One um, where we just varied the gender of the person, so they either saw a male or a female senator. And then we also varied whether or not we embedded any information about this person being power seeking or not. So there's essentially only four conditions that these folks were assigned to. And our hypothesis was that people will be less likely to vote for a power-seeking woman than a power-seeking man. And just to give you a sense of how we manipulated power-seeking intentions in this study, I don't think you can probably see it from your seats, but essentially all it says in this article is just this one little line that says the Oregon Sun Sentinel, that's the newspaper, described him, that's the politician, as one of the most ambitious politicians in Oregon and as having a strong will to power. So that's it, that's all they read about. Um, and here's what we found. We found that in the control condition, and this is the condition where there was no power seeking information, so men and women were the same. Um, basically, people were equally likely to vote for the female politician in red as the, as the male politician in blue. And so although these bars look a little bit different, I'll have to just tell you when they're not. Um, and in this case, there, were, there was no difference. So statistically speaking, in the power-seeking condition, as we hypothesized, what we found was that power-seeking information helped men just a little bit, but what it really did was hurt the female politician. And people said that they were much less likely to vote for her simply because she had a strong will to power, that she had some intentions to actually get power. In terms of warmth and niceness, um, there were no differences between the, the male and female politician. But in the power-seeking condition, once again, what you see is that the female politician um, who sought power, had the intention to get power, was seen as much less warm and nice. Uh, we also measured negative emotions towards this politician, so we looked at people, how much people felt disdain, contempt, disgust, and revulsion, and basically what we found, again, is that the female politician who, who was said to have power-seeking intentions, uh, people had much more negative emotions, very strong negative emotions towards this individual. So this is essentially what we're talking about, what I'm talking about when I'm talking about backlash effects. These are social and economic penalties that women are experiencing from violating stereotypes. So just this one little sentence embedded in an article had these dramatic of effects on women and their actual ability to get elected. So one thing I also just want to point out, because oftentimes when I give talks, um, the very first question that I get, and Yolanda is speaking right after me, so I probably won't get a question right away, but um, usually the thing that's on people's minds or top of minds is, are, are men and women subjects or participants, are they equally doing this? Are they doing this to the same extent? And my answer is yes, they are. 
Um, and the reason being is because gender stereotypes or these beliefs that we have about what men and women are like and should be like are consensual. They're widely shared. Um, and these widely shared beliefs, even though most of the time they're implicit, we're not even aware of them, um, end up affecting our attitudes and behaviors towards men and women. So the fact that the gender stereotypes, we're all aware of them, they're in the air, we implicitly pick up on them, and then we end up acting on them even when we don't mean to. So it's the case that not only um, subject gender, participant gender, so women were just as likely to, as men to show all of these effects, okay? Um, also, we um, did extensive measures of participants' attitudes towards women, so how explicitly sexist they were, basically. Um, you know, answering questions like, a woman's place is in the home. And as it turned out, um, and not at work, and as it turned out, what we found over and over and over again was that even the people who um, scored very high on these sexist scales, who reported being sexist, were actually no more likely to show these effects than um, some of us who really disavow those sexist attitudes. So I find that to be really interesting. We also looked at any number of other variables you can possibly imagine. I'll just put one more up here, which is political orientation. That never seemed to make a difference um, in the United States, at least, anyway. So um, the, the point that I really just want to drive home is that the fact that you don't see differences among people in terms of their attitudes, the way that stereotypes are affecting their beliefs about women and men, particularly women in power, demonstrates one way that these views are pervasive and tend to be widely shared across the population. So in part two, I'm going to address this issue of whether or not men and women communicate their power differently. And I'm going to start again with an example. Um, from Hillary Rodham Clinton, she ran when she was going from first lady to state senator from New York State um, in 1999. She went on a very well publicized effort to listen, explicitly listen and not talk at voters. So she would go to all of these town hall meetings in the United States and in, in New York State and just basically listen to her constituents without giving sort of feedback. And she did this for many, 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 many months. She visited every county in New York, um, which I can tell you, having being from that area, is an incredible in, endeavor. Um, and this was largely uh, credited this move, this listening tour, basically her kind of keeping her mouth quiet, um, was credited with changing her image and actually garnering her a lot of votes. It was quite amazing. And although Clinton's listening tour was effective, I still find it at least a little bit hard to imagine a powerful male politician, at least in the United States, engaging in the same behavior. I don't know if any of you caught the filibuster that happened that shut down the American government a couple weeks ago, but um, I was looking and um, it's something like the top 50 filibusters in the history of the United States are all men. So um, there's not a lot of listening going on there. Um, but it does raise this question as to whether or not men and women are going to respond differently to power. And specifically, what I'm really interested in this, in this study, and I'm going to tell you about, is about speaking time and, vol and basically talking time. And the fancy word for that, the shortcut word, is just volubility. So how voluble you are. It's basically how much you're talking and other people are listening. Okay. So volubility and power has a very interesting relationship. Um, we know, for example, that powerful people have the license to talk more than people with less power. Some really interesting studies have been done with non-human primates where they found that even um, monkeys who have high status in their uh, tribes will actually vocalize a lot more, make a lot more noise than the primates or the monkeys with less status. So perhaps this is universal. Um, and also we know from the perspective of less powerful people that they do allow powerful people to talk more in order to signal their deference to that person 
or to avoid negative consequences from not doing so. What about gender? So where is gender coming into this? Well, we know a few things. One is that meta-analyses from Alice Eagley, and meta-analysis is basically just a large combination of many, many, many studies, have found that on average, um, women do tend to lead in a more democratic, non-hierarchical fashion than men. And we also know from other work that men tend to be more comfortable with and behave in ways that reinforce their position in the hierarchy to a greater extent than women. So in organizational contexts, you know, talking more than other people is quite literally dominating the floor. That's like the English word that we use. Somebody's dominating the floor. And we also know that being dominant is one of the most proscribed gender stereotypes for women. Um, I also want to make a really a clear note here that um, all the studies that I'm talking about right now are about the workplace, so non-intimate partner contexts. Um, within interpersonal relationships and romantic relationships, the data look really different with men and women in talking time, but I'm talking about... <laughs> That should be obvious, right? <laughs> yeah, because usually I, I hear, I look at people going like this, like, men talk more? That's so strange. I didn't think so. Um, anyway, so, so I'm really focusing on uh, work and organizational behavior, okay? Um, and so basically, given all of these data, and uh, put quite simply, my basic hypothesis for this study was that there should be some sort of positive correlation or some relationship for men between having power and talking a lot or vocalizing a lot, um, just like the non-human primates. By the way, that study was done, I don't know why, but only with male primates. Who knows? Um, okay. As people ask me that sometimes, they're like, do female primates? Um, and for women, there should be um, a very weak association or perhaps no association at all. So uh, what I did for this study was actually um, pretty uh, unique for a social psychologist. I went to an archival data set, one I'm very familiar with, which is the United States Senate. Um, and I used this organization because it was possible to look at the relationship between power and talking time in the sense that it's a unique organization and that you can actually measure in a quantitative sense how much power these politicians have. But then you can also measure, again, quantitatively, how much they're actually talking because it happens to be the case that um, in the United States, uh, there's a law that um, every single moment of what happens in U.S. Congress has to be videotaped and then also archived um, electronically, basically. So every single thing that's ever happened in, is, is there, basically. You can find this. You can find these data. Um, and what was also neat, sorry, about these data is that unlike doing experiments, obviously these folks in the Senate didn't know that I was doing a study on them. <laughs> so that's always a good thing, right? Um, I chose two years where one party was in charge in each year, 2005, where the Republican Party, the Conservatives, 2007, were the Democrats, the more liberal party. And um, I measured, um, like I said, the amount of time that each spent, senator spent talking on the Senate floor. So just calling data from C-SPAN and the congressional record. So in minutes, I know exactly how much time each person talked. And then I also obtained an individual power score from a group of political scientists um, for each senator. And so uh, this power score, just very quickly, was made up of four components. One was their position, so essentially their tenure, how long had they been there, what committee assignments were they given, so were they given an assignment on a committee called appropriations, where they're the ones that actually give out money as opposed to just authorizing money, so that's a very powerful position. I looked at, ind uh, part of this uh, index is indirect influence, meaning are you such a successful politician and so powerful and you have so much money that you're able to give money to other politicians. Um, that happens all the time. Um, 
legislative activity. So this is not just how many bills each of these um, officials introduced, but what actually passed. And finally, um, earmarks, which I mentioned before, are these special blocks of money that go to individual states in America. So all of this combined together gave each individual um, senator one power score, essentially. So what I found, um, was that um, in terms of talking time or volubility, my hypothesis, um, I supported my hypothesis in that for male senators, um, so on the uh, y-axis here, you're looking at talking time. On the x-axis, you're looking at um, their power score, which goes up to 100, okay? And basically what you're seeing is that there's a very, very strong and robust relationship for male senators between how much power they have and how much they talk. So it's, it's really um, just even without getting into fancy statistics, you can just look at a raw correlation coefficient and I believe they're over you know, 0.75. So if you know anything about statistics, that's a very strong relationship. Um, for women, as I suspected, uh, this was not the case at all. So for female senators, um, there's essentially, as you can see, because the line is flat or flatter, um, there was not a significant relationship between how much power they had and how much they talked. Okay? And on average, men and women were actually talking the same, and on average, they had the same power score as well. But to sort of simplify this graph, if you just look only at the high power senators and how much they talked, um, what you'll see is that for the years 2005 and 2007, um, just looking at the top most powerful senators, the male senators really did dominate the female senators in terms of how much they were actually on the floor, even though those high power female senators had just as much power as the male senators. So there's still some unanswered question, which is, is there some sort of causal relationship? So is it the case that having power leads to talking more, or is it that talking more leads to having power? And how does gender play into this? Um, and why is there this difference? So I did an experiment, and there are sort of two main hypotheses going, which I'm going to go through quite quickly, and you can ask questions later. One has to do with this idea that some people are, or that women are simply just interested in establishing rapport or a nice, good relationship with other people. And so sharing talking time is one way you can do that. You can show respect towards other women in a group by um, basically sharing talking time. Um, and the fear of backlash hypothesis is, is a new one in, in this field and one that I'm really excited about because it takes um, data about stereotypes and sort of transmutes it into essentially how men and how this how stereotypes actually affect men and women's behavior okay and so this fear of backlash hypothesis goes like this um, being highly voluble is going to result in backlash even for powerful women so they may avoid expressing their power in this particular way in other words by talking a lot and dominating the floor in order to avoid incurring penalties or backlash effects. So those are the two hypotheses I was working with. And in this experiment, what I did was have male and female professionals, all working adults, um, were randomly assigned to either imagine they were the most or the least powerful member of a, a working team that was uh, trying to generate a marketing strategy. And then participants rated how much they would talk and a number of other <coughs> measures. And what we found, or what I found in terms of uh, talking time or volubility, is that when um, men and women were in this low power condition, when they were the low power members of the team, they basically talked about the same. But now, mirroring the Senate data, what I found in the high power condition was that men talked a lot more than women did. So there was a very strong, significant difference. And that looks just like the data that you saw with the Senate. So it appears that the causal direction could be going in the way of 
having power leads men to talk more, basically, because in this case, people were randomly assigned to conditions. Um, in terms of establishing rapport, women were, on average, much more interested in having um, rapport with their colleagues. And now I'm only showing you slides from the high power conditions here. Um, and items involve things like, I'd like to connect with others in the meeting, et cetera, et cetera. And in terms of concern over backlash, um, I asked participants questions like, would you be concerned that people would judge you for how much you talked? Are you worried about the way that you may be perceived negatively for dominating the floor, et cetera, et cetera? And what you can see is an absolutely, well, maybe you're not a social psychologist, but I am. This is a huge effect. <laughs> so women were much, much, much more concerned than men um, even when they were in this high power condition, that they might experience some of these backlash effects. And just looking at these graphs sort of next to each other, um, I hope you can see that the effect for concern over backlash is much, much bigger and stronger. The difference is bigger than it is for um, this desire on the part of high power women to establish rapport. So um, now I'm going to show you a model. I'm not going to walk you through it, but I'm just going to verbally tell you basically what this is showing. Um, basically, um, it's a regression model that's trying to predict participant gender and from volubility. And essentially, when you look at factors like being afraid of backlash and also this desire to establish rapport, statistically speaking, what you find is that it's really only women's concern that they might experience backlash that accounts for the whole effect. Okay. So I know this is a little bit confusing, but essentially when you're pitting one of these two hypotheses against the other, um, the data do show that it's fear of, of backlash effects that's driving this. So are women correct that they might encounter backlash from talking too much? Um, in this study, I'll go through this quickly, um, I had adults evaluate how much power um, either a male or a female CEO who either was described as talking more than others in power or less than others in power. So people evaluated their desired, um, their deserved power and also their suitability for leadership. And uh, what I found was that for the male and female CEO, when they were described as low in volubility, in other words, talking less than others, um, people thought that uh, the male and female CEO deserved um, about the same amount of power. However, when women were described as talking more than others in power, this is when they experienced the backlash effects, and men actually experienced a slight boost. So talking more than others is actually, in this case, this experiment helping men out a little bit. But it's certainly the case, and consistent with my hypothesis, that women were in fact correct that they would experience, even if they had a lot of power, some degree of backlash from talking too much. Indeed, people also in this study had negative moral reactions, similar to the earlier study I told you about. So um, people had negative moral reactions to um, the female CEO who was described as talking too much. So in essence, for men, there is this strong relationship between power and volubility, probably such that power causes greater volubility. But for women, this relationship is elusive. Um, it's much weaker, if not non-existent. And so the second point from these studies is that powerful women appear reluctant to be voluble in order to avoid these backlash effects. And what I just showed you in this very last study is that they're actually correct to anticipate this. So finally, um, I'm going to just wrap up now with um, some data about how women's power can be more fragile and easily lost than men's power. This is most of what I do my work on, so I have a lot of studies on this topic, but I'm just going to tell you um, basically about some work that I've done on anger. And, um, okay. So, um, this is just, an, once again, another example. I'm using Hillary Clinton all over the place. My apologies. Um, but uh, when she was uh, thinking about running for president uh, a few years back, um, this gentleman, Ken Melman, 
he was then chair of the Republican National Committee, was going on national television and basically saying to everybody that Hillary Clinton was just simply too angry to be elected president. It was just never going to happen. And, um, you know, although Ken Melman is a brilliant political strategist and he obviously knows what he's doing, um, I think that his comment really does raise this really interesting issue as to whether or not um, even emotion expression like anger or sadness or different kinds of emotions that we experience at work could actually have a dramatic impact on our chances, our women's chances of gaining power. And so that's essentially what the, these studies, and again, I'm just going to tell you about quickly um, two of them. Does expressing anger actually impede a woman's chance at gaining power and status? And we know anger expression very quickly can serve as a power cue. So there's a study that was done that found that when they used only male subjects, people, um, subjects in the study were actually more likely to give status and power to an angry man compared to a sad man. So they were more likely to elect him to office, to pay him a much higher salary, to hire him for a job, and to give him more power and independence in that job. And my main question here, without getting too theoretical, is very basic, which is just that, is this effect also true for women? So um, I would argue no for a number of reasons, um, the primary reason being that anger really is a stereotypically masculine emotion. And in fact, um, people believe that women express all emotions except anger and pride more than men. So anger and pride really do fall into um, sort of this masculine emotion stereotype. And that's Howard Dean, if you don't remember that. So um, in this study, the basic methods overview is that I had, once again, working adults. I don't use college students in my studies. Um, and what they did was essentially watch a videotape of a job interview. And in this videotape, um, the people in the videotape were asked about a time when something went wrong at work and then how it made them feel. And uh, then um, the people in the study, the subjects, rated the target on a number of dimensions, how much power they deserve, their salary, and also why they felt a certain emotion. So in this first study, I have a whole bunch of studies, but I'm just going to tell you quickly about two of them. Um, participants were randomly assigned to watch videos, one of four videotapes, one of either um, a man expressing anger, uh, a woman expressing anger, a man expressing sadness, or a woman expressing sadness. Um, and uh, this was a direct extension and replication of the study I told you about before by Larissa Tiedens. And in terms of deserved power, basically what I found when asking how much status, independence, and power does this person deserve after you watch the videotape, would you hire them? Would you want to work with them? Et cetera, et cetera. Um, basically, what I found was that uh, pretty dramatic effects. So for the male target, similar to what um, another researcher, Larissa Tiedens, had found, people thought that the angry male target deserved a lot more power than he did. But the angry female target was the one who was really discriminated against. So she was seen as unsuitable for leadership positions, unhirable, um, and essentially emotionally out of control. That's kind of how they rated her. Um, in terms of yearly salary, uh, basically what you're looking at is um, this is a statistically significant difference for the female target between anger expression and sadness. So anger expression, once again, is hurting her ability to earn a salary. and it's, it's really helping men quite a bit in this case. Um, in this second study, what I did was answer this question. So Yanka had mentioned at the beginning of this talk um, about whether I may or may not be talking about sort of some solutions to this problem or what we're kind of doing about it. And um, I'm going to just present this study um, because I think it offers just a glimpse at one potential solution. Um, and then I'm going to discuss some more uh, after I describe this study. 
But so there is this question, um, which is when can women express anger, right? So we all, whether we have power or not at work, tend to come into situations where we may need to express anger to get what we want in some way, to express disapproval. There are many, many reasons why anger can be a very functional emotion at work. But it appears as though, um, based on the first study that I showed you, that it's really quite off limits for women. Um, also, as a side note, I've done this study where I also vary whether or not the people in the videos are presented as being very high in power or very low in power. So they're either a CEO or um, a male clerk, basically. And what happens is that for the female CEO, um, she's still discriminated when she expresses anger. So just having that power doesn't appear to be helping her or buffering her in any way. Um, what I also found in that study, as I mentioned before, is that there was a strong internal attribution that was consistently made for women's anger. And what I mean by internal attribution is essentially people um, would say things like, she got angry because she's simply an angry person. Um, but for the man, they would say things like, he got angry because of the situation. You know, because clearly there was something about the situation that caused this. But for her, it was just sort of a part of who she is. Um, people also said that she was just, as I mentioned before, simply an out-of-control person. So there's something just about her that was emotionally unstable in some way. So the idea behind this study was that if, in fact, these quote-unquote internal attributions are explaining some of these effects as to why women are losing power when they express anger, is there a way to short-circuit this process and have women actually present external attributions or explain their anger? Would that help the situation? So is that going to level the playing field? So in this study, what I did, um, this time I compared anger to a no-emotion condition. Um, and then I also had a, th a third set of conditions, male and female, where in this job interview, these individuals, the male and female actors, just very, gave a very, very simple explanation for why they had been angry. Okay? So they made an external attribution for their anger. And what I found on this deserved power measure, um, uh, basically you're looking at almost the same data as the previous study, but that in the explained anger condition, um, men actually lost a little bit of power, which I think is interesting. I didn't predict this at all. Because <laughs> men don't need to explain their anger. That's like a whole dissertation right there. I don't even know what that is. Um, I'm just going to focus on what I hypothesized, um, which did turn out to be the case. So it was the case that for women, um, actually offering a really reasonable, measured explanation for an expression of anger actually um, had this effect of people not discriminating against her. So I think this is sort of a really kind of hopeful message that um, there may be sort of a way out of this uh, emotion dilemma. In terms of yearly salary, basically um, the data look exactly the same. So uh, women, again, once they explain their anger, earn just as much as um, men who explain their anger. Um, it still appears as though the man who does not explain his anger is doing pretty great, though. <laughs> and this is in dollars, not euros, by the way. So um, just to wrap up sort of this data portion of my lecture, and I believe I'm almost, I should be done by now, um, we know our, what I try to argue here is that gender stereotypes impact women and how much power they may get, how they communicate their power, and whether they're going to hold on to it at all stages. And the first stage being merely having just the intention to get power can actually harm women more than men. Um, that men really do, men and women, um, in some instances, can communicate their power differently. So in the case of volubility or talking time, which is very strongly tied to gender stereotypes, 
high power men are really much more likely than high power women to dominate the floor or talk a lot more. And finally, um, women's power may be more fragile and easily lost um, than men's power in the sense that just mere um, small expressions of anger, um, simply being described as kind of talking too much at work, um, as I mentioned before, self-promotion, but I have a lot of examples of this from my research, um, just basically showing that women's power um, can be more fragile and easily lost than men's power. So what can be done? Um, so after um, Yolanda speaks, um, I'm hoping that we can sort of have a larger conversation about this. This is not what my research specializes in, but I'm starting to really get into this area. I can tell you a few things, a few practical things. Um, in the area of um, gender research, a lot of researchers describe um, women trying to ascend corporate ladders or trying to get power, or even not, just trying to survive in the workplace as balancing on a tightrope of sort. And they say that women are balancing on a tightrope between sort of being nice and being able, in other words, being competent, right? And there's always sort of this balancing act happening. Um, and so it's clear that to gain power, women absolutely have to be competent, and they do have to be assertive in some, in some ways, like Sheryl Sandberg mentioned in Lean In. But at the same time, what Sheryl Sandberg did not mention was that they still need to be mindful of these very strong gender proscriptions against women being too dominant, right? And so, Walking the tightrope involves being mindful of communicating some degree of warmth and communality at the same time that you're communicating you, meaning if you're a woman, communicating competence as well. Um, also, it looks like there's a whole new kind of area of research about just offering these really simple explanations. So I gave you one with the anger example. Let me give you one more because I think this is a great one. Um, especially for young women who are negotiating their first jobs or their first salaries. Um, uh, on average, women initiate negotiations less than men, and also research shows that people are less willing to engage in negotiations with women. So women tend to just do worse all the way around in negotiating salary and whatnot. But one really interesting study by a friend of mine at Harvard, Hannah Riley Bowles, found that um, offering a simple external attribution um, for why they were initiating negotiation totally eliminated this effect. So let me explain. So when the woman, um, when a woman went in basically um, to negotiate her starting salary or whatever it was she was doing, she basically used the explanation that, oh, well, my mentor told me that I had to ask you <laughs> that how much other people are getting paid, you know? Or there's all these different ways where essentially, I know it sounds kind of like a cop-out, but I mean, my attitude at this point is let's do what we can, you know? If that results in women actually getting paid comparable um, to men, go for it, right? You know, um, I think it's a good idea. Um, and finally, um, there's obviously a lot of just major structural and organizational issues that I didn't even begin to touch on. Um, I could talk about that forever. And I, I didn't talk about that because I was only talking about stereotyping. But um, we, um, I have a study going right now where we are working on sort of some workplace programs to basically educate employees and especially employers on gender biases and ways to combat them because it's not simply at the hiring stage, it's at the stage where people are making decisions about promotions and raises and all sorts of things where we really need to have sort of a higher awareness of essentially what are the barriers that, that women are facing. So um, that is where I'm at and thank you very much for your time.
that okay? Yes, that's okay. perfect. Great. And there's water. Yes, that's oh. nice. Get some Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to be here. And first of all, I want to give my compliments to Victoria for giving a very interesting and inspiring lecture. And I want to thank Janka Stoker for inviting me here to be the co-speaker. And first, I'll give you some, well, how to call it, credentials. And I believe, I believe women can make an important difference. And I believe, and I have believed that since I was very young, that all individuals deserve equal rights and equal chances, irrespective of race, sex, age, or sexual orientation. To me, more women in decision-making positions is an important goal in itself. But I think, I also think, more women in decision-making will contribute to the quality of decisions being made. More women in power is part of the solution for many of the big questions the world faces today, amongst which sustainable finance, sustainable business models, climate change. After more than, what is it, 100 years of feminist struggle, it's still a big question in itself why there are still so little women in power. And the research of Victoria makes us understand the many, many complex and subtle gender mechanisms at work here. Her work shows us that there is a trade-off between femininity and leadership, whereas masculinity and leadership go along together very well. And to put it simply, you can be a nice guy and a good leader, but you cannot be a nice woman and a strong leader at the same time. And wow, that is really quite an annoying message. And it's a rather pessimistic one. For me, though, this message wasn't entirely new, as I spent quite some years of my working life on research and policy making on gender issues. So when I entered management positions myself, and later on when I entered politics, I knew something about gender and power. But when you are in the middle of it, it's very hard to rationalize, and it's also very hard to build some wise strategies on that. And that brings us back to the importance of research, such as that of Victoria, because it shows us how gender works in environments of power, and it enables us to design those strategies and to help more women attain and maintain positions of power. And I think it would be very interesting to enter more into that in the discussion itself. But before sharing some of my own experiences with you, I would first like to give you a short impression of the Dutch situation over the past, what is it, 10, 15 years, as far as women and power is concerned. What was special in the Netherlands was that from 1989 till 2002, we had a special Secretary of State here for emancipation policies. And that was important as usually emancipation policy was only part of a much broader portfolio of a minister or secretary, and they seldom gave this priority. But this secretary had no other objective than to improve women's position in the economy and in society at large. And she didn't have a very strong position in the cabinet. And I think that was almost impossible with the portfolio she had. But she was ambitious, and she devoted quite some time to the cause. And at that time, I happened to be her project leader for a long-range policy plan on emancipation. And part of that plan were very ambitious target figures for women in positions of power. For example, in government, we should have 50% women in 2010. In parliament, 50% women in 2010. And business, 20% women in 2010. That were the targets. And during the time we formulated those targets, so that was uh, 2000, I guess, government had 30% of women. And that's not too bad if you compare it to the states, I guess. And parliament had about 35% of women. But business, only 4% of women. And how have we been doing then since that time? Well, government, 
In 2010, it had only 20% of women. That was almost an all-time low. But in 2012, and luckily enough, we had a new government, and it happens quickly in the Netherlands, we had 40% of women. So that's better. Parliament, now, about 38%. So that's not a, much, uh, a big difference with 10 years ago. And business, Victoria showed a figure of 14%, but I found only 5 to 9%. So that's rather low still in the Netherlands. And in Holland, we have 11 different parties. That's really quite different from the situation in the States. And nowadays, only one of them, the Party for the Animals, I'll explain uh, to you later on, the <laughs> Party for the Animals. <laughs> that party, it's a serious party, and I like them, I should say that. <laughs> but that party is led by a woman. All other parties are led by men. And in 2010, the situation was quite different. We had five female leaders then. So the conclusion, if you look to the Dutch figures, can only be that there is really very little progress, and we, we even see some stagnation. And this is a worldwide phenomenon, phenomenon. and that's, that's the power of the book Lean In of Cheryl Zandberg, that she shows us that this is really a worldwide uh, uh, going on, and, um, well, that we really should do more to change it. And that raises the question of why there is so little progress. And I think there are still many, many women and men that believe that women are simply not ambitious enough or that women have a strong preference to combine work and family life. A few weeks ago, I was in a panel discussion in a theater of my birth town, Venlo. And this discussion was on the book Lean In of Cheryl Zandberg and how to be successful in work as a woman. And the theater was really fully booked. More than 350 people in there, mostly women. And they were very eager to learn about the issue. And that was the good news. In fact, I thought it was amazing to see so many people there, because a few years ago, such a topic would well, only attract the 25, perhaps at most 50 people. And the success of Lean In and the many, many discussions it has brought up all over the world might even be the beginning of a new revival of the feminist movement. Perhaps this is wishful thinking, but for me it would be very, very welcome. But back to the point, why is there so little progress? I think one of the reasons is that very few people know the facts. Gender is one of these typical issues everyone has an opinion about, but only very few know the facts. And in the panel discussion I just mentioned, some of my co-speakers, even some of my co-speakers, were not aware of any impact gender might have in the workplace. And they became a bit uncomfortable or even annoyed when we discussed the large body of research and evidence on gender, power and work life. And this is a reaction I have often encountered in the different fields I've worked in. In research, in policy making, in business or in politics. Why is it that people become a bit angry when you mention the facts about gender? What then is going on in their minds? That would be a nice topic for research too, I guess, and perhaps a lot of research has already been done. But I can only guess now, and my guess would be that many people like to think about themselves and their professional lives as a construction of their own choices. Because if it's not your own choice, you would have to admit that circumstances were stronger than your own ideals. Circumstances were stronger than your own wishes. And many of us do not like to think that way. But the large body of research on this is, is absolutely clear. Gender is a circumstance that does highly matter. And that is an important reason why there is so little progress. Gender does shape our perceptions, and Victoria has showed it extensively. Not only of what it is to be a woman or a man, but of many, many things in life, including our perceptions of what it is to be a successful person in power. And gender and ignorance about how it works explain much about why there is so little progress, I think. But I think it's not the whole story. 
My feeling is that the lack of progress in the past years is also due to the worldwide crisis we are in now. And in fact, this crisis already started uh, in 2001 with the attack on the Twin Towers. And since then, we saw a rise of populist parties all over the world, and we, we felt a deep social cultural crisis. And of course, then in 2008, the financial crisis resulting in a deep and everlasting economic crisis, or still lasting, let's hope it will not last forever, but still lasting economic crisis. And I think it would be interesting to see some research on this interaction of crisis, gender, and power. And my hypothesis would be that during times of prolonged crisis, there is a growing call for strong leadership. And that would mean that during times of crisis, it is even more difficult for women to gain and exercise power in leadership positions. And perhaps this could also explain why there are so little female leaders in politics in the Netherlands now today. And time to bring in some personal experiences with gender. I have many of them. It's much too much. But I want to, ex uh, to, to share some with you. And the first I want to share is my experiences with assessments. During our professional lives, most of us undergo one or more assessments. And I was assessed for leadership positions twice. And the first time, I was quite comfortable with the results and recognized most of the comments. With hindsight, however, I have some doubts, especially after reading Victoria's research. I have some doubts on the remarks the assessor made on my impatience, on my eagerness to get results, and on my ability to listen. I was a strong project leader during that time, but the urgent advice was to work as a team manager for some years in order to develop my relative weaknesses. And me and my bosses, we decided at the time that this was a good idea. And so I spent quite some years on a job where I did all kinds of things that I didn't like very much. And I even began to doubt whether a leadership position was a good idea at all. And then to the second assessment. It was really a strange one. The second time, I wasn't at all content with the results. The test itself was okay, but the results didn't fit with my personality, I thought. In short, I was pictured as a dominant person that pursued her own goals, didn't give much about the corporate goals and the people that work there. Well, that's a nice, <laughs> a nice result if you want this job really badly. And I had a thorough discussion with my assessor. And he told me that he seldom met such a dominant woman. <laughs> and he reminded me that a week before the assessment, I had called to ask whether it was possible to start later, because that would fit better in my agenda. And did I realize, he asked me, that I was the first ever to call with such a question? And my intuition told me that it would be wise not to become angry. So I stayed nice and calm. I apologized for the phone call and informed what method they used in the assessment. And he told me that they used separate male and female skills. And after asking some more, he told me that on this female skill, I was quite extraordinary. But on the male skill, I was rather nice and social. And after a long, long discussion, he agreed that we close this assessment on, a, an, on an average male-female skill, and I was able to get the job I wanted so much. Lesson, be aware of gender stereotypes in assessments, and stop putting your energy in working on your weaknesses, but start doing what you are good at and like most. Then a second personal experience, communication. Victoria told us already a lot about communication and about dominating the floor. And the picture Victoria gave doesn't really fit with my own experience. I have heard powerful women in the Netherlands spending quite some time on talking. But perhaps this is a gender-biased perception, could be. And it would certainly be interesting to see what the results would be for the Dutch situation. 
But besides the amount of time spent talking, the contents of what is being said are also important. And here there was really an eye-opener for me uh, in the way that gender enters into how we formulate our statements. Men, simply put, men tend to postulate with a firm point, and women tend to argue with many, many commas. And one of my coaches used an illustrative example from the family sphere. And I'm going to tell you this. My mother, she told me, lives in a retirement home. And both my brother and I try to visit her once a week. Both of us had to skip one visit because we were very busy at work. And my brother called her and told her, Mom, I can't come this week, but I'll be there next week, and I'm really looking forward to it. And she answered, OK, son, I'm happy to see you next week. But my coach went on to tell, her call was very different. She told her mother, oh, mom, I'm very, very busy because I have to give a training in Zwolle and therefore I can't make it to Hengelo in time and I'm really sorry, but I can't visit you this week. Why are you always so busy? Her mother complained. And why are you working in Zwolle? It's so far away. Can't you find a nice job closer to home? And all that work isn't good for you anyway. I hardly see you nowadays. Well, for me, this was a very effective example. Because every argument you use gives your colleagues and your opponents a chance to criticize you. I had much more effective meetings and appointments since I became aware of how gender affected the contents of my communication. It takes some practice, but it's not very hard to learn how to frame your message in a statement, delete all arguments you don't need in that stage, and close with a firm point. And then wait and see what the reaction will be. And then quietly decide how to respond. Perhaps an argument, perhaps a question, perhaps a proposal. And the big difference it makes is that you are now not in a reactive or defensive position, but you are in the lead. And that, ladies and gentlemen, brings us back to the end of my contribution. Or brings us to the end of my contribution. Some final remarks. I'm convinced that we need more women in power and that knowledge about how gender works is crucial to achieve this. But knowledge, of course, is no guarantee for success. And we should realize that it is personal talent and strength that make a person grow to a position of power. But it might be gender bias that restricts a woman from arriving or staying there. And I think it's therefore important that we do much more research on these issues. And it's important that women in positions of power speak out in public and reach out to other women. And I'm proud to be able to deliver a small contribution to this tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the both of you. Uh, may I invite you to step over to the two mics over there. Uh, and then Kirsten is around with a mic for the audience. Um, and then we can have a lively debate, or maybe first some questions and then a debate. Who wants to pose the first question? Over there. Um, my question goes to Victoria, and I wanted to know, um, do you think that women working in science also are influenced by the same gender stereotypes? It's a fantastic question. I um, actually do research in this area as well. <laughs> um, and um, part of what I was, the stereotypes about women in science, at least in the United States, but there's been worldwide sort of verification of this, is that women are simply less competent at science, technology, engineering, and math careers. And furthermore, um, so we published a paper uh, last year basically randomly assigning professors at Research One universities in the United States to get resumes of male or female um, uh, lab managers applications. So like undergrads going from undergrad to grad school. 
and um, they discriminated against the female candidate relative to the male candidate. And so what we're doing right now with these stereotypes is putting together these extensive videos um, <laughs> that can be sort of disseminated across you know, any English-speaking country that educate um, science professors, but also men and women themselves about some of these stereotypes and sort of how to get around them and eradicate them because sometimes the fix is actually quite simple. So let me give you an example um, without making this answer too long. Um, one area that we find that uh, discrimination flourishes in, where stereotypes really play a role, is when criteria for success are ambiguous. Okay, so um, and and professors, uh, employers don't even realize they're doing this. So merely by saying, um, you know, we are, you know, I I'm, I'm not a scientist in a bench lab, so I can't describe this. But basically, setting very very clear criteria um, really does help sort of eliminate some of that discrimination. Also, awareness of the biases those kinds of things. But um, I think the, the point that I really kind of want to also drive home is that there's also a lot of research, not mine, but others, showing that um, women themselves are very much affected by these stereotypes about science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and, um, you know, simply checking a box that they're a woman before they take one of these tests can actually affect their scores negatively. So if you are one of these women interested in, in doing this, it's very worth, you know, sort of thinking about the fact that there, there are no data that women are worse at science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, and, and probably it's not true for you either. You know, but that is, like, not you, but <laughs> one. It's not true for one, so... Thanks for the question. Okay, thank you. Over there. Yeah, yeah, in the back, and then uh, and you. Hi, so my question's for Victoria again. So, I work in philosophy, <laughs> and women are horrendously underrepresented in yes. philosophy. It's even worse than physics, right? It is. I went to a talk recently arguing against making people aware of implicit bias because people who are taught about implicit bias are then more likely to be biased towards people because of their gender. It's a really odd study. I'm not sure why it is. So they were arguing instead for like anonymous reviewing, for example, rather than making mm -hmm. people aware. Are you concerned? Yeah, so there, there's two points in what you're saying. I am aware of the study you're talking about. I'm very, very much aware of what's going on in philosophy um, and how that is a highly combative and difficult field for women right now and what to do about it. Um, the study that that person was referencing about implicit biases, um, really that's not true actually. So there is positive effects of educating people about implicit biases. Um, oftentimes people's first reaction is to be defensive, but it is effective. So it actually doesn't make them more biased in the end. It really doesn't. That's, I've never seen data ever to support that, but I'm aware of what you're talking about. Um, and I'm trying to think of what else I was going to say, but yeah, so that, does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. Okay. Okay, uh, over here, yeah. I had a question for Victoria as well. Um, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, interesting talk. And my question was, um, you gave the example of anger and how externalizing emotions countered the negative effects of anger for women. I was just wondering whether your more general message would also be that as long as we can, if you can provide externalizations, for example, for power seeking, then that means that the stereotypic behavior that you're displaying won't be attributed to the person and that that's one way of sort of, yeah, countering that negative effect of being maybe uh, displaying uh, male behavior. Would, would that, is that kind yes, of the overall I, message? Yes, absolutely. And I think um, you're picking, on, picking up on something that I didn't get a chance to really get into, but it's a sort of a new area of research of mine, but it's certainly the case um, it really does depend on the behavior, right? So if you take, like, for example, the power-seeking behavior, how there's discrimination against women who are ambitious in getting power, 
um, just like the anger example, you could one could, as a woman, easily come up with some sort of external attribution or externalize that, such as saying, well, I've always wanted to work with preschool kids, and I started working at this preschool, and then I realized that the funding was unfair. And you know, so you could sort of get into this explanation that really explains that you're going to use your power for good, right? So that could be one way. But I think um, with a lot of these kinds of things where you have to offer an external attribution, um, it, it, it can be difficult because it can feel insincere. You know, if that's how it, I mean, if you are just angry and you don't want to explain yourself, that's one thing. Mm. Well, right? I think from a social change perspective, it's also not necessarily a good way to go because no. it means that your male behavior, which is actually that's right. good, is being that's seen right. as incidental. So if I'm competent and I say, well, this is just for now, <laughs> totally. then uh, it's not changing the stereotypes in general. No, it's, it's not changing the stereotypes. It's basically putting a Band-Aid on things for women who are asking for the yeah. Band-Aid is okay. what it's doing. Yeah. And if we're talking about real change and getting more women in power, um, you know, the things that Yolanda was saying were absolutely right, but I mean, we're talking about major structural changes in organization where you know, at least the United States, um, you know, daycare is somewhat affordable, that we have some maternity leave policies. I mean, the list is about this long of organizational changes that could result in changing stereotypes. But the workshops I was mentioning and the reducing of implicit stereotype bias, that does get at, that's not a Band-Aid. Yeah. That's something else. But I am in complete agreement with you that that is a Band-Aid type solution, nevertheless, um, at talks like this, people want the Band-Aid. Because yeah. you hear well, it's it. It's an individual like, way out, right? Yeah, like what do I do? Yeah. 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 Thanks. Okay. Somebody else. Yeah, in the back. I have no problem with you talking. I'm sorry. Um, I have a question for both of you, actually, and maybe you can discuss it together. Um, thank you both for your lecture. Um, I was wondering what, Victoria, you feel about the quota that the... Uh, University of Groningen has of appointing more female professors mm -hmm. and I think that also well um, uh, do we have quota or goals goals yeah that's yeah. Yeah. a big difference I don't think we have quota <laughs> by the way but so we have goals yeah goals. we have goals about the percentage of, of, of uh, professors at the university and I think Yolanda is, is for it because well she was uh, one of the policy makers of well having a uh, a percentage of female uh, high position, female in high positions. So maybe you can talk about it together. And well, do you think it will work? Yeah, so, uh, so you are asking for quota, right? Not for having goals, or maybe for both. Goals or quota? Yeah, both actually. Yeah, I think okay. for for having yeah. a, a percentage in well universities or other organizations. But would you feel like that would help um, uh, um, get rid of the biases that people have in the uh, about female? Great question. Yeah. Yeah, get rid of the biases. Well, in the Netherlands, we, we don't have many quota. These were targets I was talking about. So it's also goals, yeah. uh, not quota. We have now a, a, a quota for uh, women in boards, I guess. Yeah, it's what we were discussing, it's yeah. 2015, uh, yeah. they become effective, I believe, and it will be 30%. And you see there's a huge distance between this, uh, yeah, the quota and, and the actual figures, which are about 4 to 9%. Um, I think quota can be effective if they are realistic. Yeah, the, so they should be challenging, but the gap shouldn't be too wide because then uh, you get, uh, you know, I think you get, in, inevitably you get discussions about um, that boards need to um, hire women that are not uh, competent at all. And you should avoid these discussions, but I think it's good you have the discussions. And that is what quota uh, stimulate too, that you have discussions in the places where you should have these discussions about how gender works and about how the appointment uh, processes now um, work. And I think that's, that's the beginning. But I don't believe quota will be the solution, um, but, but it's a start, I guess. Yeah, in the United States, interesting, um Quota has a very bad connotation. People don't like it. Um, but there have been a lot of business uh, or case studies of different firms that have had this goal of trying to increase women in some capacity or another. And one of the ways they found the most successful was to have the specific goal in place and make it an 
ambitious one, right? Not one that's just easy to achieve, but then have all of those um, department heads be responsible for reporting to each other in a social setting and then reporting to um, their, their, their other peers and basically the organization. And so it's a, it's a really interesting way of applying kind of social psychological pressure because, you know, you've got to answer for yourself, mm. right? You may not have a quota, but like your department had a goal of hiring this many more people and they found that to actually be pretty effective. It's not going to be as effective or quick as quotas, but it's no. another way of, of going. But have you found, Victoria, in, in your research or in other research, that if you raise the number of women above a critical mass, that you then can change uh, gender stereotypes also? Um, of course it helps. When you have more women, you, you, well, the norm on the workplace can change, and that could help. But I think this, this, these gender stereotypes itself uh, are so persist persistent definitely. that we I mean, have to live with them. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, when women become in the majority then you're, you don't identify as a woman because you're yeah. just a person kind of in the organization. I still think stereotypes are at work probably yeah. in those situations, but maybe not as strongly, mm -hmm. just because you know if there's 70% of us are women, I'm more free to be you know, aggressive or something, and you're more free to be passive because there doesn't need to be somebody, fill, uh, or ma a man and a woman filling those roles. That makes sense. Yeah, maybe it's, maybe to add this. We did a study on the stereotype of the ideal leader, and uh, what we saw is that 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 still today we think that an ideal leader has masculine traits. But what we also found was that if you have a female leader yourself, or you work in an organization with more female leaders in in percentage, the stereotype becomes more androgen. So that means that that the value of feminine traits becomes a bit higher. Okay. So in that case, you could say that stereotypes are or it can be changed, but it's very small, yeah. But so it does make a difference whether you have experience with something opposite to the stereotype. Yeah, yeah. definitely. There's a really interesting study done in the United States where um, uh, people entering all women's colleges as opposed to co-ed colleges had their implicit stereotypes changed dramatically in mm -hmm. favor of women and so saw women as much more capable of being scientists and whatnot because those were their role models. Yeah essentially, which I think is really interesting. Okay. Over here and over there. Maybe first here and then you. Um, Victoria, in the beginning of your presentation, you said a uh, unique feature, if I understood correctly, a unique feature of gender stereotypes is that they have a descriptive and a prescriptive yeah. component. So do I understand correctly that this uh, prescriptive component does not apply to, say, stereotypes about age, ethnicity, or other things. And if so, well, if so, why? Uh, what does yeah, this unique, powerful role of gender stereotypes come from? Yeah, why is this the case that gender stereotypes? That I can't answer quite as well, because um, then I'd have to compare it to every other kind of stereotype that we sort of have. Um, but like, um, just just to give you an example, so in the United States. People believe that African Americans, black Americans are more musical, musically talented than white Americans, but nobody endorses the belief that they should be more musical. Does that make sense? Kind of? So that's the distinction between the descriptive and the prescriptive. And just theoretically speaking, um, I have a few other papers on this right now demonstrating that it is in fact this pre and proscriptive component of the stereotype and not just a simple expe expectancy violation as would be expected from the descriptive stereotype violation that's driving the effects. So a highly technical answer. Well, it's a technical question, I guess. It's a technical question. <laughs> it's a good idea to study this, yeah. Well, as you know, I'm, my question comes from the age stereotype idea. Yeah, the age stereotype one is really interesting. There's prescriptive um, stereotypes about older, older people. They should be calmer, wiser, whatnot. Interesting. Yeah, I, I, I think there probably are. They're, they're, they're just... The study that I'm aware of is that um, was mainly comparing race to gender. Yeah. Um, but was also, um, and sexual orientation is in there too, but age wasn't. But if I were to guess, I would guess that the effects would be a lot smaller for age. So there may be some prescriptions, but it's not going to be quite as meaty. Okay. Sure. 
You had a question, right? Thank you. I have a similar question to one of the previous ones, but uh, I think it's good to have some background information first. Uh, this university uh, has had some uh, goals to have uh, a certain percentage of women uh, uh, as full professor in, I believe, 2010. And when they found out that they were not going to make that percentage, they treated the goal as if it were a quotum. And they promoted several women in order to achieve their goal. So, um, <laughs> one of the previous... Maybe there's somebody else from the audience who wants to respond to this, so I will give her the, maybe give her the mic before... All then, right, that's all right. <laughs> uh, but now, uh, my question, uh, somebody else asked what were, uh, what it is could, could positively affect those uh, stereotypes, but my feeling is that if somebody is promoted just, if a woman is promoted just because there are more women needed in those positions that this might negatively affect those stereotypes. So what do you think about that? Okay, Petra, you may go after. Yeah, first Petra, or... Uh, do you, yeah. Are you going <laughs> angry, Petra? <laughs> <laughs> Very angry. <laughs> A warm angriness, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Let's put this in uh, perspective. <laughs> Our university did a study about the different, there was a change in defining the tasks of people in the, in the rules that establish what rank you have in the university administration. And so they had to look at what tasks people were performing and if they were actually ranked at the right rank on the basis of the tasks <laughs> that they were performing. Uh -huh. And uh, in this study it came out that an unusually high percentage of women were performing tasks which were superior to the rank in which they were ranked. And so the university administration and the board decided that all the faculties could propose women that they thought should be ranked as full professor on the basis of the <laughs> tasks that they were performing to be actually promoted to this level. Every faculty proposed women, except the natural science faculty, <laughs> and, <laughs> and then there was a committee which uh, looked at these uh, files and recommended a certain number of these women for promotion, not all of them. So and now it's your turn. Okay, so now, so this, these are the facts. No, 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 no. <laughs> But now back to your question. So your question is, can it harm? No, yeah, so, so may I just paraphrase your, paraphrase your question towards them? Your question is, may it even harm instead of do good for female, yes. female um, managers, professors or whatsoever? Yeah? I'm aware of the background. Thank you okay. for exp the explanation. But I think the question is still relevant because if women okay. are promoted because of this reason, yeah. So, but, so we now know why they were promoted, so they were actually were not promoted because they were female, but now back to you. Does it harm female managers, professors whatsoever to get a position because of the fact that they are female? In um, the studies that I'm aware of, and again I'm just going to speak from research, um, there are data to suggest that when um, Certain groups, they tend to be um, white Americans and men um, in America because they're not the beneficiaries of affirmative action in the United States. Um, when they assume that somebody, um, a woman or a person of color, got there because of affirmative action, they view them very negatively. Um, but that assumption can be wrong. <laughs> You know, and so that's where you know I appreciate your response because you know people could be sort of walking around with this assumption that somebody just got there because of their race or gender or something like that. And so those are the studies I'm aware of. So in fact, you're you're right in the sense that when you just assume 
somebody got there because of their race or gender, you're not going to see as much respect given towards that person. And maybe disdain and jealousy as well. Um, but again, the assumption can be wrong. Do you want to speak to that? Well, no, I can imagine that because well, your research showed uh, that women in more powerful positions already have some difficulties in being considered as competent. That's right. And that this uh, can, can uh, well, raise the discussion again. And I think it's, it, it's a burden on the shoulders of these women. But uh, on the other hand, um, it's very important that more women enter these positions. And, and, and they are, in fact, strong persons, so I think they can handle and they can show you that there, in fact, is a bit of gender bias in your question itself. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have a study, actually, that suggests that even when women are in um, counter-stereotypical jobs, so women, like, being a police chief, or, like, in the United States, like, being the, the chief judge or something, when they make just really teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny errors, really almost nothing, um, they are seen as much less competent and more likely to lose their job than men in the same position. So you're seeing gender stereotypes at work in that sense as well. Okay. There's a question over there, I think. Yeah, and then you. Yes, uh, I would actually uh, like to have some, well, some tips or advice from you both uh, for <laughs> women who are in the beginning of their careers and, yeah, experiencing these... Uh, or difficulties. <laughs> Yolanda, you want to start? Me <laughs> first. <laughs> <laughs> no, because well, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to hearing about strategies to build on the research. Yeah, I, I, I only tried some myself and not, not everything was very successful. Not everything was... <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about my own strategies as well. So. It's rather female to do it like this, ladies. Yes. So come on. <laughs> now, important is, I think, first to be aware of how it works, because then um, you can play with it, and you can have some fun in playing with it. So if you're aware about how communication works, if you're aware about how anger uh, you know, enters into uh, perceptions, then you can, you, know, you can wisely play with it. And that's, uh, so, so be aware of, of what is going on, and be aware of how it works, um, get some intervention, yeah, a group of other women in, 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 in similar positions and, and discuss and talk uh, with each other about it. I think these things can be very, very helpful. And, uh, well, choose your goals. Because I think changing the gender perceptions themselves isn't the goal of most of us. We just want to do our jobs well. So, uh, well, be aware of how they work. Don't try to change them themselves, but, but play with it and, and be effective. Um, by, by being wiser than these perceptions. Yeah, I would also say, um, so I mentioned at the very end of my talk that idea of women walking the tightrope of nice and able. Um, one way that I've been helped by this, um, and again, I'm not sure how successful this is, but I've seen other people do it, and it seems to work pretty well, are to identify um, women that happen to be really good at this, and you know who they are. You know who those women are and see what it is that they're doing and how does that compare to what you're doing. Because that's the best kind of advice I can sort of give you at this point. I can tell you that's what you need to do, but then maybe there's a way that that person could mentor you or help you kind of navigate some of those things. The second thing, which I think is extremely important, I teach classes on leadership, and we are big into having students get feedback from each other. Um, feedback is really hard to get. You don't always want to hear it. Um, but you might get feedback that you are not speaking up enough. You may get feedback that you're curt. You may get feed Who knows? You just don't know until it actually comes back. And so, you know, setting up that crucial kind of group and getting that kind of feedback can be extremely helpful. Okay, thank you. I, uh, I get the uh, response that I'm sometimes too directive, and um, uh, that's a bit of a male characteristic I got, I think. Mm -hmm. So maybe it just makes me a bit angry inside that I have to really 
change and be more feminine in the leadership role I have. Now, perhaps you don't have to change, but you need right. a good circumstance to be director. Who didn't, it That's could right. be that it That's works true. the same way as, as Anglinus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I really, agree. Yeah. I agree. I agree. And also thinking so about give a good explanation. what context that's happening in, too. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I thought Yolanda made an amazing point when she was talking about, you know, not just doing what you're weak at, but finding what you're really good at and you love doing and keep doing that. Is that a good way to paraphrase? Yeah. You know, so if you're constantly coming across this wall that's telling you you're just being too directive and masculine, hey, maybe you're not hanging with the right people or going down <laughs> the right career path. Yeah. That could be a possibility. It's Don't a just assume advice. that you need to like wear pink and you know whatever. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Okay, yeah. we have two more questions here, and then I go back to the front. Yeah, so, I, 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 I gave my uh, watch to uh, yeah. Yolanda, so we can go on and on and on because I don't have any. What, what time is it? <laughs> it's a quarter to ten. Okay, great. <laughs> Um, I just wanted to um, go back to the discussion on quota and to um, mention some doctoral research which was done in the Netherlands a couple of years ago by someone in Nijmegen who looked at the role of or the importance of gatekeeping positions in the appointment of um, women to positions of power, um, especially in the university context because we know that the figures are miserable for the Netherlands in particular um, in terms of the European context. And um, the key issue is that a lot of men are in gatekeeping positions and then that has subtle, that brings subtle mechanisms into play where um, uh, positions which are often made on the basis of informal networks. So you get a recommendation from a friend of yours, or friend, mm -hmm. colleague of yours, for someone who might be suitable, that those have a big impact on who's named as professor. And another mechanism which was um, very surprising for me was, um, but very recognizable once it was mentioned, was this um, idea of recognition. And um, we talk a lot about role models, so us, you know, women looking up towards role models, but it works the other way around, so that when you are wanting to appoint a successor, you're going to look for someone whose quali qualities you recognize, and these are often quite intangible qualities, so um, as a male, you might be able to recognize potential, for instance, or potential to become a leader in a male more easily than you would recognize it in a female, because a female is just, you know, more mysterious to you in some sense. Mm -hmm. And that, so, so the, 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 the criteria which were expected of, for instance, female candidates per professor were much more strictly tested than in the case of a, of a male. So a male hasn't published yet, but he's got much more potential to publish, mm -hmm. whereas a woman has to have proven that she's got a great publishing record before she would get um, named into that position. So I just wanted to mention that research um, to talk about yeah, that. Yeah, Marieke van der Brink, right? Marieke van der Brink did that study? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a great. Um, McKinsey's study also just found that too, which is really interesting. McKinsey, the consultancy that... Um, managers, male managers saw a lot higher potential in their male consultants and subordinates than they did in their females, and this was a big problem. Yeah. yeah. It's a great study. Thanks. Okay. There's another question over there. Thank you. So I just uh, wanted to make a statement. I think the, 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 re the, the weird relationship between the, vo uh, the, the time to speak and the power, the, the, what men show and what females show, we are much more capable of kind of getting to the core of matters in less time, right? <laughs> <laughs> Makes that might be sense. a positive explanation. Yeah. At the workplace then, at right. least, and not I at home. A, I, have a, I have a serious <laughs> question. Um, I talked to one of my colleagues in Italy uh, a while ago, and I was amazed by the number of female uh, professors in Italy. And she told me that the status of, fe of professors in Italy kind of went down. And so much, yeah. much more female actually joined universities, and the men ran out. And so yeah. I wondered, isn't... Is that kind of something we have to be afraid of the moment too many females kind of get into a certain kind of business or whatever? I think in politics, I mean, you are always uh, uh, called Yolanda, whereas the guys are always kind of, they use their last name for, for the Most, people. Mostly I mean, I'm called uh, Mevrouw Sap, and I like Yolanda more. I Okay, well, I, I mean, but it seems that, that there's this, this, this idea that, that, that the, the more female, the less kind of power is in the position or is in yeah. the system. There are a lot of data on that. Yeah, that happened, yeah. It's the wet, the wet of Sulehol, I guess. Yes, it's yeah. already a very old one. What is it? Nine, the 60s or 70s? It was already a French sociologist, I, I guess, who did some research on that and found that if more women enter a profession, then the status of this pr pr profession goes down. Any profession. Any profession. Yeah, in including salaries too. 
So perhaps that's also one of the reasons, amongst the many others, why politics in the Netherlands has a rather low status nowadays, because we, <laughs> we have quite some women in it, more than in the States, and I guess there it still has a, a higher status, perhaps. Yeah. It's one of the things that, that, that yeah, okay. plays a role. Uh, there was a question here. Hi there. I guess my question goes back to this uh, uh, this advice that you're asking, and also Tori, to your 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 comment on a band aid. So there are certain things that we can do, like leadership training or assertiveness training, or getting this feedback and all of those sorts of things. But I think what's really interesting about all of those things is what they're going to reflect back as just the stereotypes in other people's eyes. So you said someone might think that you're curt or that you're too dominant and all of those things, but that's not an objective understanding of whether you're curt or dominant. It's a reflection of the stereotype that's there. And as you said, that's a Band-Aid. But it's also a Band-Aid that puts the, I guess, the onus and the blame on women. Yep. Women are not in power because they're not assertive enough or they don't have leadership or they don't have all of those things, rather than saying people think these things and that's why they're not in there. So I guess for me, there's a question in here somewhere. The question is maybe how do we walk the line between really needing to give individuals advice about what they can do to help themselves, because it's a very relevant question for you. But how do we find the balance between that and actual social change, where we're not just replicating the stereotypes and putting a Band-Aid on them, mm -hmm. but actually changing them? Wow. The million-dollar question? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can just tell you, I, I completely agree with everything you said, and I think you're mirroring a lot of what I was kind of, kind of trying to say, because I hate those fix-the-woman things, and that's one of the reasons why Lean In bothered me a little bit, because it just felt like a fix-the-woman kind of mm. a, th a book, you know? Um, and there needs to be massive organizational change. Just from a research perspective, I mean, I... Um, I find happy accidents all the time, like what I found here with external attributions or this kind of stuff. And so those are little nuggets of things I can say, well, this is something you can do as a woman, you know, but um, what I'm concentrating a lot of my time on are these interventions because I am a little bit, you know, at my rope's end with um, trying to give women advice on this. So I don't have an answer. I can't balance it, you know. I don't really, no, perhaps a bit of an answer, but I think we, we, what we really need is structural change, and that is policy yeah. change. That is and it's, it's really important to have more women in positions of power, but I think the gender stereotypes itself also depend crucially on women's position in the family, and on the fact that um, women in lower income families, at least in the Netherlands, they work uh, much less than, than higher educated women, and I think that's a worldwide trend. So we really need structural change on all these levels to get rid of the stereotypes. And this is really uh, especially important to also pay attention to lower income women, to women in power, and to, you know, to make improve their positions, because I think that's a, an important turning point for these gender stereotypes. And women in higher positions could profit from that as well. Yeah. And I don't know if this is true in the Netherlands, but there's a study in the United States by political scientists that found that the more women there were in positions of power, the more attention women's issues got, oh, yeah. which kind of makes sense, right? So issues like childcare, choice, which is big in the United States, and reproductive rights, um, you know, massive things didn't happen as a result, but you do see these incremental changes, particularly at the state yes, level. I think so that's why you want more women in power, because the structural changes are going to come from the people who know why we need them <laughs> and what they're for, yeah. Yes, no, well, I do agree on that, and you see it in Europe, in the Scandinavian countries too, it? Okay. where it goes together very well. Well, in the Netherlands, we had a long tradition uh, of, of very little women in power. Um, but, but nevertheless, we made some structural change, and now we see uh, the number of women in positions of power uh, rising also. So I don't know what, what, what exactly is the causal effect, but right, right. I do agree fully that we need both. And while well, that we should be aware that uh, it's not only changing um, well, individual behavior, but it's uh, very much about structural change and policy change too. I have two more questions, three even, in the back, yeah. Um, hi, um, I had a question about um, the stereotyping and I was uh, thinking about why women are so much more negatively affected by the stereotyping. 
Um, and I read something about that uh, when, um, I can explain this best by an example, if a man, um, for example, uh, does something weird or he does something crazy, he is crazy. And if a woman does something crazy, it's because she's a woman and women are crazy. And I don't know if you are <laughs> some information about any scientific uh, backup on this kind of hypothesis that this would be true, but I found it interesting and could recognize a little bit about, uh, a little bit in this way of thinking. Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, I don't know about the crazy study. That yeah, sounds well, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Not just <laughs> an example for <laughs> give me some research <laughs> ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, so you know, it, it partially might. I'm not exactly sure if it's true that men are less affected by gender stereotypes than women. Um, I study women in power as a feminist, and so that's what my stuff is all about, and so that's what I'm the most aware of. But there are studies that do show um, that men can be penalized, not quite as harshly as women, but for acting weak, for example, or for acting gullible. There are proscribed behaviors for men too. Now, the degree of which, that's what you're talking about, this degree, I'm not sure exactly if that's if that exists. I think that's an open empirical question, right? Would you guys agree? Yeah, okay. I've got my consultants in the front. It's like everything I'm saying, I can be like, is that like? <laughs> Yeah, so it's about individual, yeah. like being individualized or not, right? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Okay. There in all in all the back. Hi there. My question was on um, uh, the data Victoria showed. Um, based on that, the next time I get angry on the work floor, I'll think of this and I'll be like. I'm going to explain why I'm angry. So um, that will help my social credits on the work floor. But what about the volubility you showed us? Because um, I couldn't get a real advice out of that one. Should we just, as women on the work floor, talk less and listen more and just accept no. that way? Or yeah, I'm not, I'm not in favor of that as a prescription coming out of those data. And, and let me tell you why. Because um, there's a lot of really interesting ethnographic data um, meaning like interviews with people and kind of like sitting and watching how people work. And um, even though like it may be the case, like my data shows that high power women don't talk as much or dominate meetings as much as men, um, women also, and this is true in the Senate as well, and I can tell you this from personal experience or the United States Senate, um, will do more behind the scenes dealings. Um, and that seemed to work seems to work quite well for women. So even though in a meeting, say, of 10 people, they're not dominating the floor completely, whether they have power or not, they are, um, at least in these ethnographies, people, the researchers report that they're going around and, and building coalitions and um, networking in different ways that actually gain them more power. So even though talking isn't doing it, there's other things. That, that women can do. Um, okay, thank you. Okay, so and I was wondering a bit about this reason you, you give for your uh, angerness, because I think it should be a very good reason indeed. Yeah. What, what did you give, because if you st say on your jobs, well, I'm angry because you did so stupid yesterday. But then you get yeah. a very nasty yeah. discussion, so, I guess. So it should be a very good reason. But did you have any research in, on that? Yeah, in this case, otherwise um, all of us will will fail tomorrow. <laughs> I think it was a good reason. Uh, I had it pre-tested by other participants to ask them if they thought it was a good reason. And essentially, the reason why in this scenario the person got said that they got angry or got angry was because um, they were lied to by a colleague and they lost an account. So basically, they they were they were deceived. So that's a good okay. reason. Yeah. yeah. It should be something that you cannot discuss about, I guess, this reason. Yeah. It's about you, not about the situation. But it's about why you are angry. Why you are angry, yeah. that's right. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, but before you know, you you enter into a discussion about whether you are right or wrong. Uh, yeah. uh, you are stupid because you become angry uh, for such a stupid reason. <laughs> that's that's not what you want. So you have to have so a good reason. It's it's a dangerous strategy, I guess. Right. This is, this issue too of um, not expressing a lot of emotion. I didn't get into it during my talk, but I think it's a really interesting one. So Madeleine Albright, you know, yeah. she has yeah, she was the um, Secretary of State years ago, um, and she had said that people, uh, if you watch her, she's a very calm person, very stately. Mm -hmm. um, and when she initially was in the job, she was told for months and months and months that she was emotionally out of control and she needed to tone it down. So um, the strongest gender stereotype that we hold that I didn't even address in this talk is the fact that people believe that women express and are a lot more emotional than men. I'm not going to get into whether that's true or not. <laughs> so I all think we're human beings and experience the same emotions, but the expression of emotion is very, very strong. And so what she said is she basically um, just turned it down and became pretty emotionless in her job. And she claims that that was one of the key factors in her gaining a lot more influence in her job and being a lot more effective. So it could also be that people are reading more emotion into women than they are into men. You know, so that, that's another possibility that I didn't even address in this study, but I think is true. Okay. Um, I, I would like to um, to say that uh, I do agree with the point of women um, give, given more opportunities to um, to um, to get a higher position and that it might be a development that will be going on for a couple more years. What I would like to state is that um, looking at my personal situation, I've always been brought up with um, respect and that's... Um, my way of going about on, on the working uh, floor. But I would like to make the point that whether a, a, a woman is in power, it doesn't necessarily mean that the working space would be um, positively in influenced. And uh, I have encountered a lot of mean women. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter whether they're white or, or black, as I am, I, I still do often wonder why it is that um, seeing the problems that women encounter on, on a worldwide level, why is it that women can't find unity in different teams and just work together and just get the job done? There's so much gossiping and backbiting and backstabbing. I mean, is it a, a women's issue? Does this happen with men also? I would like to know if they have a, a specific study about this. Do you okay. have uh, an answer? Do you? <laughs> because, yeah, I, um, do you have an answer? I, I mean, I, I do. I do, kind of. I mean, this is, I, I think there's, you know, some truth to what you're saying, and there's something called the queen bee syndrome in psychology where, you know, women who are on top tend to treat those beneath them particularly bad. Um, but, you know, what people don't see in those scenarios is, is, is younger women go in expecting older women because they're women to... Um, maybe be nicer because that's our stereotype of what women are supposed to be like, right? And um, then in the same situation, they don't evaluate whether, you know, all the men that they're working for or working around are also acting the same way. And so I guess just to sort of challenge that a little bit, I would just say let's, instead of concentrating on you know, kind of how women are taking each other down because, um, you know, it could be you're around, you're around the wrong women too, right? Um, you know, there's also sort of a culture among men that's very competitive and backstepping and hierarchical. So it's not like it's all, you know, roses and sunshine for them, <laughs> I would say, either. But um, I think we are you know, particularly surprised when a woman in power that we're working under, we know, is not kind of going out of their way to, to be especially feminine and warm. 
Yolanda, yeah, final agree. answer of today. Do you agree? Yes, I do agree. I think that's an important... Uh, well, I, I, I've, I've worked in environments with uh, lots of men, and I've worked in environments with lots of women. And not, not m many times in mixed environments. And I must say that I, I didn't have the experience that women are so nasty and gossiping and so on and so on. I think it's pretty much of a gender bias in this perception too. Uh, but, but at the same time, I think it's important that more women in positions of power become aware of um, well, the power they also have to help other women. It, I, I can imagine that you are not always feeling like that because you are already busy with your work and you don't, well, you, 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 you don't want to get in such a gender stereotype yourself. But nevertheless, and that's also the importance, I guess, of what Cheryl Sandberg does and tries to show us. Well, simply stand up in such a powerful position and reach out and say, well, I want to help other women to, uh, to gain power too. And I think that, that that can be very powerful. But at the same time, we, we, mustn't, we, we can't expect from every woman in a powerful position to do this. Because, well, obviously, she also has other things to do and important things to do. <laughs> so we should be a bit patient and... Not too harsh on women, too. Okay. Thank you very much to both of you for your uh, inspiring talk. Yeah. Sure, sure. Um, so I want to thank you both for inspiring talks, for very, very good and strong examples from research, but also from practice. Um, I think one of the things we learned today maybe is that band-aids can help you individually but on a more social level we need structural change so maybe you can take that message home with you and make use of it together because I think we have a lot of young men and women here in the room so maybe you are the ones that can start with these structural change as well. So I want to thank you both. Uh, I have the same book but for okay. you it's in English of course <laughs> uh, and I hope you don't already know it, but if you do, then let me know. But this is for you, it's okay. the Dutch one. Or do you prefer Dutch? Or do you want to learn Dutch? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, thanks, thanks again. So Thank you so much. Thank you.